What's up guys, Doll Matter here, and today we're gonna be reacting to another Drakini Fell video. This one we got the IGN or IJN, sorry, Congo. So uh we actually talked about the ship in one of the other videos. It was in a battle with I can't remember which ship it was, uh, but it was in a battle with one of the other ships, and I found it interesting that it was named after you know, named the Congo, because I was thinking the country of the Congo. But apparently it's named after a Japanese mountain or something like that. I'm not entirely sure. Somebody mentioned in the comments, but I can't remember exactly what the comments said. So apparently it's named after something in Japan. But anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. The Congo class were an important turning point for the Imperial Japanese Navy. Okay, I didn't realize it was a class of ship. I thought it was just a singular ship. Was one named the Congo? The one, the original ship, probably? And would also become some of the most discussed Japanese capital ships outside of the Yamato class, largely on account of them seeing the most active combat of any class of capital ship that flew the flag of the rising sun, and there will eventually be a much longer format video on them. The origins of the class that lay a beautiful in the ship. so-called 8-8 plan, which was conceived to achieve a balanced fleet and called for eight battleships and eight armoured cruisers in when it was first put forward. Of course, the British promptly ruined this plan by launching first HMS Dreadnought and HMS Invincible, rendering both the pre-Dreadnought and the armoured cruiser obsolete. Faced with having to start over again, the armoured cruiser element would now have to be made up of the new Dreadnought armoured cruisers, and since Japan was still modernising, the decision was made to seek help from their allies, ironically enough the British, in the design and construction of their new class. Unsurprisingly, asking the British Yards to design a battlecruiser in the middle of the pre-World War I arms race with Germany resulted in a ship that shared a number of superficial similarities with the Royal Navy's splendid cats. One ship was to be built in the UK, the Congo, and Vickers, the shipyard, would ensure enough knowledge was passed to the Japanese yards to allow the other three to be built in Japan which would make the Congo the last capital ship constructed for the Imperial Japanese Navy. I know they were allied at the time, but I always find it fascinating how much information a lot of these countries are willing to share um, when it comes to, you know, like this at the time is, you know, the biggest, baddest naval weapon around. And they're still willing to share that information with other nations. Now, obviously, Japan and the UK in the First World War were allied, so it does make sense that you have some information sharing. But at the same time, it's just weird to me that you would share, like, your, arguably your most vital information. But I guess another factor probably is the the rate of technological advancement at the time. They probably assumed, A, but if we ever go to war with Japan, by that point, these will probably be outdated. Which, I mean, was kind of true, right? Like, the advancement you see from pre-World War One to the start of World War Two is pretty drastic. In a foreign yard. Originally designed with 12-inch guns, Vickers did manage to slide their ever-persistent 14-inch gun salesman into at least one meeting and persuaded the Japanese to select the larger weapon, resulting in a number of rapid changes to the design of a ship that actually already started physical construction. Thus, the ship that took shape displaced a fraction under 28,000 tonnes, mounted eight of the new 14-inch guns in four twin turrets with a pair super-firing forward, and two aft staggered along the center line. A secondary battery of 16 single... Man, it honestly, it must have been wild to have been in Japan at this point, to have been Japanese at this point. Like, if, if you were born in, like, the mid to late 1800s in Japan, you're born into a feudal society that is essentially at the technological level of medieval Europe. And then by the time you're, like, middle-aged, it's, you know, as advanced as all the European countries were at the time, right? You go from these, like, shitty wood sailing ships, right, to these fucking dreadnought-class battle. Like, it's... The technological change, it's... I don't think there's anything comparable in history to, like, the, the rate of advancement that Japan made in that time period. Because, obviously, like, China, China advanced as well. But China was much slower and much more gradual. They did have kind of a burst in the 80s. Um, but by that point, they'd already advanced quite a bit, right? I, I don't think there's anything comparable in history to, like, just how quickly the Japanese advanced in that, you know, 40, 50, 60-year period or whatever it is. 
triple casement mounted 6 inch guns ran at 8 per side along with an unusually heavy for the time anti-aircraft armament of 4 single 3 inch guns. 8 torpedo tubes rounded out the armament with 4 per broadside fitted in submerged positions. Four screws were driven by 65,000 shaft horsepower, giving a top speed of somewhere between 27 and 28 knots, depending on the ship in question. Armour was fractionally lighter than in British designs, with a maximum belt thickness of 8 inches and a maximum 2.75 inches thickness on the deck. The conning tower was notable for being massively protected, with a 14 inch thick plate reflecting a definite idea to actually use it. The four ships were laid down in 1911 and 1912, launched in 1912 and 1913, and would start to enter service between 1913 and 1915. The first two, Congo and Hiei, were built in yards that were experienced in warship construction and thus were faster from keel to commission compared to Kirishima and Haruna, which were built in Japanese commercial yards due to lack of space in naval docks. All four would actually see a relatively quiet patrol duty during the First World War, even though the British did kind of want them to come back, but the Japanese said no. But the class was seemed to be destined to whittle away in the interwar period, with Hiei stripped of armour and weapons to become a training ship, and later the equivalent of the Emperor's Royal Yacht, to avoid being scrapped under the Washington Naval Treaty. <laughs> That's actually kind of funny, just making a yacht. It's not a battleship, it's the Emperor's Yacht. <laughs> and Haruna spending much of the 1920s in reserve after suffering from an explosion in one of its turrets. However, in a potential sign of things to come, the Hiei's armour plate and guns were carefully preserved in a warehouse just in case. The class, in a whole, would see two major refits or reconstructions during this period. The first was started in the late 1920s, which increased the elevation and rate of fire of the main armament, fitted new engines which allowed a funnel to be removed, although the addition of torpedo bulges meant that the overall speed actually dropped to 26 knots. Some improvements to the layout of the armour were also made, although maximum thickness was not increased, and the ability to carry and launch aircraft was added. The second round of modernisation started in the mid-1930s and was far more extensive. During this process, Japan withdrew from the naval treaties, and so Hiei was brought back into service with its carefully preserved equipment brought out of storage, and so all four ships would receive what amounted to a near-full rebuild, although details varied on a ship-to-ship -ship basis. This added still more armour, although again this was bringing up various parts to pre-existing maximum thicknesses rather than increasing it, with the exception of deck armour, which did have an overall increase in thickness. The main guns received the Type 3 anti-aircraft shell, the secondary battery was cut down by two guns, but the elevation was increased, the 3-inch anti-aircraft battery was replaced by eight dual-purpose 5-inch guns in four twin mounts, and heavy machine gun positions were added. These were subsequently replaced by ever-increasing numbers of the infamous 25mm cannon, which during wartime would in some cases grow to over a hundred weapons scattered across the ship's decks. The boilers were completely replaced by modern... Man, this just... This... Like, uh, what is it? This tower here? It looks like the most, like, hodgepodge together thing I've ever seen in my life. ...units, and this ramped the power up massively to 136,000 shaft horsepower, which sent the ships north of 30 knots, thus allowing them to operate with the carriers. The superstructure was also significantly overhauled, giving the ships the full distinctive pagoda mast, which supported numerous new fire control systems, searchlights, radio, and anti-aircraft positions. Although, again, the superstructure did vary on a case-by-case -case basis with one of the... Okay, so the, this is the difference between the two of them. Yeah, it, it's just like, it's just layered on top of each other. Just such a, a weird looking design. Ships being used to prototype the kind of superstructure planned for the Yamato class. So these things were essentially just dreadnoughts modified. Off, the ships were lengthened by 26 feet, which altered their length to beam ratio in favour of even more speed. Although classified by some as fast battleships, they were in most respects still battle cruisers. Much like the modernising of HMS Renown, which was almost of a similar scale, did not in fact make it a battleship, 
even though Renown was actually better protected than the Congo class once both classes had been through their refits. During World War II, the class could be mostly found escorting invasion convoys and carrier units in the opening stages of the conflict, and as the American forces began their counterattack, these roles would diversify to include raiding and shore bombardment. It was in this role that two of the class would be lost in the Guadalcanal. Man, this is some, this literally this picture looks like it's from like an anime or something. Like this is, <laughs> this tower just looks like some like hodgepodge, fucking. Um, steampunk disaster. <laughs> campaign. Hiei ended up in a close-range knife fight with a US cruiser and destroyer force, and despite inflicting severe damage on her opponents, her lack of battleship-grade armor meant that she was heavily damaged by short-range 8-inch shellfire in return, and was subsequently scuttled following air attacks the following morning. In the same campaign, Kirishima engaged the USS South Dakota in a night action, and stood a chance of destroying the newest US battleship as its electrical system suddenly failed, only in turn to be ambushed by USS Washington and sunk by salvos of close-range 16-inch shells. Congo and Haruna would see action at the Battle of Leyte Gulf during the Battle of Samar, with Congo being sunk later in 1944 by US submarine. Haruna would survive to almost the end of the war, being bombed and sunk in Kure port by U.S. carrier aircraft, and then subsequently scrapped post-war. That's it for this video. So these things were essentially just modified dreadnoughts, then. That's, that's kind of the vibe I'm getting from this video. I'm not entirely sure if I'm true. I guess they were, like, some of them, from my understanding, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the way he was talking about this here, but it seems like the, the initial ones were literally just dreadnoughts that then the Japanese modified, like, I guess two decades later. Um... And then they kind of based the later Congos off of that design. Am I, am I getting that correct? Uh, but either way, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.